Good morning and welcome to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. It is Thursday, March 11th, and we are going to be starting with H 183, an act relating to sexual violence. We do have a strike all amendment that is on our committee page and um, attorney Michelle Childs will We'll do a walkthrough. And uh, witnesses, we I will not necessarily be going uh, in order uh, due to some some schedules of uh, of the witnesses. So we'll hear from Major Ingrid Jonas after Michelle. So thank you. Good morning, Michelle. Good morning. So uh, is it okay if I share my screen and put the document up? Sure. Thank you. So committee members, if I don't see your hand because of the screen sharing, please just. Just jump in with your with your questions for Michelle. Can everybody see the document? Yes. Awesome. Okay. Can you make it a little bit bigger. Is it possible to make it a little bit bigger, Michelle? If you tell me how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is a way. I think it's down at the bottom right. Yeah, bottom right. That's right where it says 100 percent Yeah. Bottom right. Then you can you can make it a little bigger. Okay. Is that helpful? Is that okay, Martin? Are you more? My, my old eyes can see it, I suppose. Oh, I, I hear you. I know I can't, I don't want to scare everybody by getting too close to the screen, but I got the same issue. So <laughs> this is probably a good trick for to learn. Thank you. Sure. Okay, so we're gonna we're working off of draft two point three of a uh, strike all committee amendment, and um, most of these changes you've already seen and we've discussed, but there have been a couple little tweaks. So, but I'll go over um, and I've highlighted a lot of the language um, in here. So, in section one definition of consent. You'll recall at the last hearing, we discussed uh, that the some of the witnesses and the discussions we, between the attorney general's office and the state's attorneys um, had suggested that on line 11, instead of having a knowing and voluntary agreement, that it be a knowing or voluntary agreement to engage in a sexual act. Um, the next one is on line 13, and this is adding a definition of incapable of consenting. And so I'll, I'll just kind of note it here. And then when we go through the rest of the draft, you'll see where, uh, where we use that. But this, is, this definition is used in current federal law from, um, from Title 10, where we borrowed some of the other language, the standard. And so incapable of consenting means the person's incapable of appraising the nature of the conduct or is physically incapable of declining participation in or communicating unwillingness to engage sexual act at issue. Okay. Um, again, I'm going to just mention, and I, I've said this a few times before, but um, definitions that you have on line 17 through 19 those are uh, just up updating terms. So there's current language um, in the in the chapter that uses outdated terms. And uh, you know, whenever we come across those outdated terms, um, we change them to make sure that we're using respectful language. And in consultation with um, our healthcare attorneys in our office, these are the terms that they said that should be substituted. So that's not a change and that's always been in there, but I just wanted to note that as we go through the rest of the draft is that um, there, it's not adding things necess necessarily, it's just um, clarifying that these are the terms that are used in current law that, that are the respectful terms to use in those particular circumstances. So section two, um, and so this is our sexual assault statute. Um, I'm not gonna go over the stuff that's always been in there and that we've already, already talked about. And I'm gonna focus on the highlighted, but let, let me know if you have questions about something that I'm, that if I skip over it. Um, so subsection B, so you recall that this is the existing statute for subsection B 
um, addresses the issue of if an actor administers drugs or alcohol or other intoxicants to a person um, and then um, in, uh, without their knowledge um, or against their will and then engages in a sexual act with them. And so there is a piece to that, but then there's also an additional piece that, that you've added. So you see in B1, um, it is, uh, is a, a, it's just kind of rewording the existing law. Subdivision B2 is that no person shall engage in a sexual act with another person when the other person is, and here's that term that we define up above, incapable of consenting to the sexual act. And the new language that we've just added is due to substantial impairment by alcohol, drugs, or other intoxicants. And that condition is or reasonably should be known by the person. And so uh, the addition of substantial, it was in response to some folks concerns that, um, that there might be, uh, that it could be interpreted without the substantial that basically anybody who's under the influence of drugs or alcohol is therefore incapable of consenting. Um, and so um, that's not the intent. And I think this language, if you look at the combination of using the term on line 18, the person is incapable of consenting, which means you go back up to the definition, you say basically they're not able to appraise the nature of the conduct or they're physically incapable of signaling their willingness to engage in that conduct. So you have to have that. So they're incapable due to being substantially impaired by an intoxicant. So kind of um, those two things together, I think, addresses um, some of the concerns raised by witnesses around, well, you know, people in, you know, engage in sexual conduct all the time uh, when they're voluntarily uh, intoxicated. And that doesn't necessarily uh, mean that, that, um, that there is a violation of boundaries or that, the, that, um, that there's a, a crime here. So, Noting also what you used to have in an earlier version of subsection B was kind of belts and suspenders language around um, vulnerable adults and engaging in a sexual act with vulnerable adults. And that was removed in the last version at the request of prosecutors because they felt as though um, they were already covered um, by things elsewhere in the chapter, as well as the abuse, a sexual abuse of a vulnerable adult statute that we talked about at the last committee meeting. So that's just not in there any longer. Michelle, before we go yep. any, off of substantial, um, uh -huh. there's, there's not a uh, definition of substantial, is there? No. So would that be determined in case law, you know, as time goes on? I mean, that's going to be that's going to be something that they're going to show that, you know, the prosecutor is going to show uh, going to offer facts or evidence as to, you know, whether or not the degree of intoxication of the person. I mean, substantial is something that is uh, obviously it's subjective, but it is used. We use it frequently in, in drafting um, and there's no, you know, there's no way to really get at anything more uh, more precise than that. I mean, you're not gonna say, well, if the person has a BAC of 0 0.08 or whatever it is. Right. Um, so I think substantial is something we use frequently and uh, folks don't seem to have an issue around interpretation of that, so. Okay, all right, great, thank you. Yep. So if, if I can jump in just to just to stay on that word, the the lawyers in court won't rip that word apart of of interpretation, what whatever way somebody wants to take it. Well, sure. I'm sh that's going to be one of the things that they go back and forth and argue about is was the person substantially impaired by an intoxicant. And that's that's a matter for them to, um, you know, for the state to have to prove. Um, but I would say, I would I would rather than speak for them, I think maybe when, because we have Rory on here and um, is, you know, I think that's probably a better question for him about whether or not he has a concern about that, but he has seen this language and prosecutors are comfortable with it. 
Oh, okay, thanks. I, I didn't know he was here. Thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, Tom, did you have another question or is your hand still up? No, I, somehow I always forget to lower my hand. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, and and like, I can only see uh, three people at a time. So if I don't see your hand, just, just shout at me. Um, so moving on. So now we're moving to section three. And, um, and in section three under 3254, we already have a lot of language around what constitutes consent. And we've kind of built that out and in a little more detail on subdivision four. Again, this is something um, that we discussed at the last committee meeting is, is that this is a reference to the rape shield law where we already have um, uh, provisions in there that talk about that you can't bring in um, the uh, sexual conduct of the of the victim in the case or the way the person was dressed, things like that. And so rather than repeat it here, we're just making a reference to it in 3255. And then I'm going to look at the lead in language on the bottom here on line 20 on subdivision six. So a person shall be deemed to have acted without the consent of the other person where the actor um, and then here's where I've got a couple new changes. Um, so subdivision D, uh, the person knew or reasonably should have known that the other person was, and you'll see right now it says, the person is mentally incapable of resisting or declining consent to the sexual act due to a mental condition or psychiatric or developmental disability. So. The changes here is we, we updated the, the language, so we struck mental condition, and we're using the psychiatric or development mental disability terms. Um, and we're, we're going back and using that definition that we added up there about incapable of consenting. And so this is an issue that I think people are, you know, rightly concerned about, that there's nothing in here that's saying that because someone has a psychiatric or developmental disability does not by nature of having that disability mean that they're incapable of consenting to sexual conduct. Obviously they are. So when you add the term in here that the person was incapable of consenting due to the disability, again, you go back up to the language and say, because of that disability, that disability makes them incapable of appraising the nature of the conduct or physically incapable of declining participation or communicating to the actor that they don't want to, con to consent to that. And so you have to have that piece. It just, it doesn't mean just because someone has a disability that they're incapable of consenting. So those two things go together. And I think when those two things go together, then it's getting at what your goal is here, which is that the person basically is not able to consent freely. Yep, Martin. Yeah. So, so just uh, I'm confirming. Is does that address? Uh, do you believe that addresses the uh, issue that was brought to us from Will DeWight and and Mad Freedom? What what you just? Uh, oh. Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. Yep. Yep. And that's why I changed that. Mm -hmm. So the language we had in there before had the old language, which was, you know, the person is incapable of resisting or declining due, you know, consent due to, but I think just, again, using a consistent term throughout the statute rather than relying on the old language, I think it just makes it a little clearer. Any other questions about that one? So subsection, subdivision E, um, and I just tweaked that a little bit of uh, to be, again, using the, the term up above of incapable of consenting. So this is in the context of someone being substantially impaired by an intoxicant. And because of that impairment, they were incapable of consenting. And then I also added on line 16, you'll see, or lewd and lascivious conduct, um, I had just kind of left that off in the earlier draft, but if you'll, you'll see is that this whole section applies not just to sexual assault or sexual act, but also to L&L. 
And so I'm just making it consistent with the other subdivisions in this section. Um, and so before I move on to the next one, are there any other questions about, um, about this particular, about kind of the, the statutory crime language that folks have questions about? And I can, I'll be here, I'll be here all morning or at least as long as you're doing it. So, um, you know, after you hear from witnesses and stuff, we can circle back and Tom? Tom, did you have a question? Yeah, now I'm having issues unmuting. So, <laughs> um, say if, if both people are substantially impaired, mm -hmm. um, would potentially, in, a, in somebody was charged, you know, with, uh, with a crime, and would it potentially go back to, um, I think it's it's section one, line fourteen being incapable of appraising the nature of the conduct at issue as a defense? No, the language about incapable of consenting is, is with Reese is, it is not applied to the defendant. It, that is, um, so, uh, so I think what you're asking is like in the case of, you know, if, if two people are intoxicated, you know, what's the culp of, what's the mental culpability of the actor if they're just as drunk as the person who they're right. having sex with, right? And that, actually, that's a larger issue in terms of uh, mens rea and culpability when people uh, are impaired and violate the law. And I would say that I would, I think that, so it's not, in, it's not, um, specific just to this instance. And so what I would say is, I think maybe hearing from prosecutors on that about how they address the issue of impairment by an actor who's charged with a crime, I would defer to them on that. Okay, great, thank you. Sure. Okay, I'm gonna move on to uh, data collection and reporting. So this is, uh, has been reworked. Um, I know some of the um, advocates who uh, were requesting that there be additional data, they have kind of reworked this and put it out to stakeholders and, and back and forth. And this is what folks have um, come back to you with is um, a tweaking of this section to be uh, making sure that they're asking for information that isn't already available or available in a certain kind of digestible format. And so what you have here is in subsection A is that on or before September 1st of 2024, and then biannually after that, DPS is to provide, remember DPS has uh, the Vermont Crime Information Center within it and they're the repository for all the criminal records. So they shall provide a statistical report to you based on data from the National Incident-Based Reporting System and the Vermont Judiciary on the following. And so uh, subdivision A on line three, the number of sexual violence cases reported to state, county and municipal law enforcement. Um, uh, in, uh, subdivision B is the number of civil sexual assault or stalking orders granted it's because you have a civil process in title 12 that allows for someone um, to obtain a civil order um, of protection um, with regard to sexual assault and stalking. Um, the number of sexual violence cases referred by law enforcement to a state's attorney or the AG's office for potential charges. D is the number of sexual violence cases charged, the nature of the charge and the disposition of those charges. And then subdivision two notes that the, that the data that's requested in the previous subdivision is to be organized um, and reported by county. So subsection B is that DPS has to make a reasonable effort to protect victim confidentiality when the statistical information might be identifying. Um, Vermont's a small state, so sometimes that can be a little bit of a challenge. 
Um, subsection C is DPS is required to post the data that's collected on its website in a manner that's clear, understandable, and accessible to the public. Any questions about that? So next in section five, um, so this is the Intercollegiate Sexual Violence Prevention Council, and we have talked about that. The only changes in this are the addition of, um, recommended addition of two uh, new members on there, and one would be a sexual assault nurse examiner. Um, and so these are the folks who uh, respond when um, someone has reported a, a sexual assault and, and they uh, go to a hospital. Um, and if your bill passes, then maybe they'll get to go to their local doctor if, um, because of that extension of funds to be able to expand it beyond hospitals. Um, and the sexual assault nurse examiner is someone who's specially trained to um, collect evidence in those in those cases, and so it's adding someone, uh, adding a same nurse, and then um, also adding a prosecutor. And the recommendation came to me that it be a prosecutor from either who's either state's attorney or the AG's office. Um, and there is just kind of hanging out there about really who appoints that person. So. Um, House Government Operations is looking at this section later today, and so that will come up. Um, the issue just for me in the drafting why I left it that way is, you know, normally if we say, oh, somebody from the state's attorney's office appointed by the executive director of the state's attorney or that kind of a thing, but I, I'm not sure who should appoint when it's from two different offices. So it, it can be anybody y'all want. I just wasn't sure. Um, and I think that's it in terms of changes. Yep, that's it in terms of amendments from the bill is introduced. Great, thank you so much, Michelle. I really appreciate sure. having a strike all. <laughs> it's much easier. Yeah. Great. So any questions for Michelle on the strike all? Again, I can't see everybody. So if I, committee members, if I'm missing you, please, please jump in. I think so. Okay, great. Then I am gonna, um, Please move to Major Jonas, because I, I know you have a, another commitment. So thank you so much and welcome. Thanks everybody. Um, can you hear me all right? Great. Um, Ingrid Jonas with Vermont State Police. Um, I've been with State Police for almost 23 years. Um, I will just add that I spent about 11 years in special investigative units and I think Rep Norris will remember me from back in those days. Um, so this bill is certainly um, nice to see and I appreciate the effort that you've um, all worked on, uh, all put in for, for the work in this bill. Um, we support the bill and we support the language. I know that <clears throat> the goal of being able to look more comprehensively at sexual violence cases which are so um, underreported um, and learn more about the trends and patterns with these cases. Um, taking a look at it from that lens of how many cases are reported to all of us in law enforcement, which of how many of those are then charged in the various counties, and then what are the outcomes? I think it could be incredibly enlightening and help uh, helpful. So we we certainly support that. Um, you know, the data already is being collected. We already have that. CRG has indicated that they can produce the statistical report um, as part of their current contract with our department. So we certainly, um, we support that. I will note that um, DPS has kind of a larger vision. The commissioner has the, the larger goal that by, you know, the end of this year, um, or the latest 2022, more of a comprehensive data initiative that should be able to, that will be public facing, that should result in anyone being able to get this and other sorts of data. Um, having said that, we certainly don't, you know, that'll happen at the same time or sooner than this uh, 2024 September requirement. So we're hoping that, that everybody will have more um, 
ability to get this type of statistical report from a public facing portal. Um, but again, this data exists. We are happy to support a report um, being produced for the General Assembly and the public. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. So section four as is uh, DPS supports is what I'm is what I'm understanding. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay, great. Thank you. Questions for Major Jonas? Okay. Great. That's Thanks it. everybody. Great. All right. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Uh, Let's move to uh, about disability rights. Zachary Hazard, you, there you go. see you, yep. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for, for having me, inviting me to this. Sure, um, thank you. And your testimony uh, is posted under, um, under your name for uh, today, so. Excellent. Um, so I'll try to be brief. I have, uh, I'll sort of put some, um, some explanation of the, uh, the testimony that we provided for the red lines and uh, I'll make a few additional comments based on the testimony that I've heard um, prior to me. Um, so just a quick sort of introduction again, Disability Rights of Vermont is the Vermont Protection Advocacy Organization. So our role is to protect and promote the rights of people with disabilities. We do that in a wide range of, of areas um, including representing victims of crimes um, and protecting their rights through that process and um, uh, relief from abuse orders and that sort of thing as well. Um, and again, as you know, as my folks know, that people with disabilities are, are incredibly vulnerable and often um, victimized. Some recent statistics I, I found recently was that nationally about 90% of people with disabilities will experience some sort of abuse in their lifetime. Um, it's really important that um, you know, that people with disabilities are kept into consideration um, in the terms of being victimized, but also in terms of their autonomy, their agency, and their ability to make decisions for themselves and, um, and that as well. And so that's kind of the, our focus here was on that balance. And so that language of incapable of consenting, we think really needs to, to, to have that balance of, um, you know, protecting people with disabilities from being victimized but at the same time, not interfering with their agency and their ability to make those decisions to engage in, in sexual activities. Um, yeah, I just heard from, from Ms. Childs earlier that, that, was, that language was apparently pulled straight from federal law. I have not looked at that, but really our only concern was just that, that the language, um, you know, without having looked at the federal law, the language that, that um, is currently in the bill just seems uh, a bit unclear so that was our, our main to come up with something that um, that was a little more straightforward and already um, you know can be found in, in other areas of the law, um, and we thought it would be more consistent throughout the um, the bill. Uh, just the language of of appraising the nature just in a little um, vague, but again, if that is in federal law and it's clear, then I think, I think we're good with that. Um, the other thing I would say on that is. Uh, the section um, further down in the bill with about you know applying incapable of consenting to people with disabilities. Um, I think again that just has just has to make sure that that being incapable of consenting is a pretty high bar, um, and that it's focused at the moment in time. So there are plenty of people with with disabilities that, for the most part, in the, most of the times in their life, they're able to understand what's happening and make those decisions. Um, and so really we're focusing just a particular uh, moment of time when the sexual activity occurred. Did they, you know, were they so impaired by their disability that they, they couldn't understand you know, what was happening or they couldn't physically stop what was happening? And I think that's, that's the conduct that I think this bill is trying to get at um, and not limiting people who may have a developmental disability or a psychiatric disability from being able to engage in sexual activities and their partner not getting in trouble for it. Um, I think uh, the other thing I'll just sort of add, you know, I thought that the language of um, substantially impaired related to, to substances, um, again, just seemed, seemed unnecessary. Uh, I think um, 
what I what I understood from from Miss Childs earlier was that it does, um, you know, emphasize the person has to be substantially impaired, not just um, not just somewhat impaired. But I do think if the language of incapable of consenting is really high, then it sort of seems redundant there. But um, on that, I would I would defer I would defer to the prosecutors because they'd be the one for having to prove that element. Um, but I just pointing that out because I I noticed that. Um, and I think, you know, again, going back down to um, the language about people with disabilities, um, one would be that if the language of substantially impaired for substances is, is really important for prosecutors, then I think that same language of substantially um, should be applied to the person's disability as well. Because again, you want to have a pretty high standard there to for that. Um, and I think that, um, I think that that pretty much covers sort of um, my comments. Again, the other thing, just to be clear on um, the disability piece, um, I think that the you know, re referring to you know, people with disabilities and the definitions that are currently used for developmental psychiatric disability is is fine. If the incapable of consenting, you know, everyone is confident that that is a, a pretty high threshold because the those definitions of disability are more for um, you know, ac accommodations for disabilities. And, and it's a, a sort of a lower, you know, it's about just determining if a person has a disability for certain benefits and eligibilities and not about, you know, um, so much, you know, again, it doesn't want to, we don't want to use it as a way to infringe on people's rights to engage in sexual activity. And so um, you do sort of need a, a higher threshold for how that person is impacted in this moment to prevent the abuse. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll be available for any questions. Um, and again, thank you for, for inviting me. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. And I appreciate the explanation of your, of your uh, testimony. Uh, and I think it'll be helpful when we do hear from, um, from prosecutors later. And I, I hope you can either stay or, or watch it if you're, if you're not available. Uh, uh, Martin, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah just a, I guess a clarification on, on your suggestion on 3252B2. Uh, and, and this is something, you know, certainly want to hear, yeah, from the prosecutors and, and uh, other folks on what they think of that. But, but the, the terminology seems to be a little bit different than what we have in our definition section of uh, mental, physical, developmental impairment, where uh, in the definition, we talk about developmental and psychiatric disability. We don't have the definition of physical. Uh, so I'm wondering if, if, if this is something we're going to do, should, shouldn't we be matching closer what we have as far as the definitions, you know, de uh, as far as the developmental, psychiatric, uh, and physical, I guess, uh, disability? Yes, I would agree with that. I think um, probably putting, uh, having the same language of, of psychiatric um, and developmental disability um, would be more appreciate than the language that I put in my edits. Um, I do think physical should be included because there can be times where a physical disability can uh, prevent somebody from, from being able to consent. And so I think that does need to be included. But um, yes, I think having consistent language would be the best way to go. All right, thanks. Can I ask a question? So, Martin, I didn't understand where you were saying add something. Can I? Well, can you I, just so so the uh, suggested uh, language uh, that uh, for thirty two fifty two uh, that Zachary has uh, suggested uh, has language uh, adding or mental, physical, or deve developmental impairment, and I'm just suggesting if we do go with something like that, that we should match the definition language. The instead should have developmental, psychiatric, and physical disability instead of the language that was proposed. Okay, are you just looking at something he he gave? Yeah, it's on it's, for... it's on it's okay. on the website. Yeah, it's all right. On, okay, all right. Exactly. I'll take a look at it. Yeah, that language suggestion. All right. So. Thanks. Yep. And I would just add on that. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention um, earlier, but Ms. Um, Charles mentioned earlier that there were prosecutors felt that there didn't need to be. Uh, disability element in this because it can also be found in, in vulnerable, the vulnerable adult statute. Um, 
I, again, I would defer to prosecutors on this for the most part, but I, I do think it would be beneficial to have some language about disability in here um, to, to sort of provide more options. And again, the, the definition of vulnerable adult is, is a very high um, bar. And I think this would allow for um, some abuse to come in under, under this statute that you know, may not quite fit, you know, the individual may not be a vulnerable adult um, because being a vulnerable adult, it really is about how the person is most of the time. Um, whereas here, this is more about a person with a disability who at this particular moment was so impaired that they could not consent. Thank you. Um, my silence means I'm, I'm, I'm taking notes. <laughs> I want to make sure I am recording your testimony. Thank you. Uh, Barbara. Thank you. Put my hand down before I forget. So I appreciate um, you, you thinking through that nuance. I'm, I'm wondering if disability itself um, limits it just because of discussions of what um, medical conditions are considered disabilities and what aren't and when that gets changed. It, should it be disability or condition um, or some other word so that we don't get hung up in um, like a federal definition that might, if somebody's having an epileptic seizure, for example, and epilepsy isn't considered a disability, uh, that's just like one example. I, or someone's on a, yeah, I, I'm trying to think of something else. I'm not sure about that, but curious to hear what your thoughts are. So I, th I think the benefit of using um, the definitions of, of psychiatric and developmental disability, and physical disability is that it already exists in um, in other areas of state law. Um, and so I think that's sort of helps clarify that and make that simple. I think, um, I don't think we have to worry about different diagnoses because um, the definition of disability doesn't require a diagnosis. It's about the person, you know, being impaired for major life functions. Um, Does so not, I, you said, sorry. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry, I didn't hear if you said it does or does not require the the major life functions? It requires an impairment to a major life function. The diagnosis is not important. So one person can have a diagnosis or not. It's It doesn't really matter. It's more about how it impairs the person. Right. And in some cases, and maybe it's just I'm not that um, as familiar with the state definition as well as um, how like insurers interpret it. But sometimes it's like, three impaired by three life conditions or I mean it seems like I've seen um, numbers put on the life conditions in certain situations before. Um, so in the under the definitions um, of disability that are included in, in this bill and included in, um, in Title I, um, it doesn't require a certain number of, of conditions. It's you know any impairment to any, any one major life function. Um, and there just, there are different definitions of disability in different areas of state law and different areas of federal law. But I do think that the one that, that's here um, covers it for the purposes. Thank you. Coach. Coach, go ahead. Good morning. Um, Thanks for your uh, your testimony. Um, this this is one of those areas um, um, when we think about the protected class um, that um, is still a little fluid, you know, too, uh, in the sense that um, uh, some clinicians that work uh, through uh, the DSM uh, <coughs> system. Uh, and using that handbook, um, still believe that DSM four uh, is the uh, uh, the Bible of choice, whereas it's been modified to five now. And who's to say where it's going to go from there? Uh, 
uh, from a clinical perspective. Uh, so I think having the, uh, uh, the parameters that you're suggesting seems to make sense uh, for consistency purposes. And having that bar set so high that uh, it's almost, uh, uh, it's more of a, uh, an impairment in a sense um, doesn't, I'm glad you brought up your point, I guess, is the main, uh, is the main thing. If we can come up with language that uh, works for consistency, um, I think Martin might have hit on it uh, with the order of the language uh, in that, uh, in your handout that you gave us this morning. Uh, so I just wanted to say, I, I really appreciated you coming uh, to help us with that. Thank you, Coach. I do see, um, Michelle, I do see that you have some things in the chat. I was wondering if, Michelle, if you could uh, speak to us on, on the record about that. Uh, sure. I just wanted to note um, with regard to uh, Barbara's line of questioning um, around some uh, type of condition that might not technically fall under the definitions of a, uh, that are in the statute with regard to disability is that there are provisions in 3254 subdivisions uh, 6A and B around incapable of consenting um, that I think encompass those certain circumstances. So somebody may not fall under one of those definitions of a psychiatric or developmental disability, but they're gonna be covered by those other sections. Um, there, is, there is still quite a, I, I think, overlap in, you know, in a lot of the language that's in here to kind of ensure that we're not kind of leaving any, any cracks there that somebody could fall, can, can, can fall through. So, um, but that's my sense is that I think you're covered in, in, those, two, in those two subdivisions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. And again, we will be hearing from, um, from the state's attorneys and uh, later as well. Uh, Coach, your hand is up, but I'm going to assume it's from before. Unless you say otherwise. Um, great. Thank you. Okay. Anything? Any other questions? Okay. Great. Well, thank you so much, Zachary. Really do appreciate your, your testimony. Great. Thanks again. Great, thank you. Okay. Yep. Okay, uh, Rory, why don't we start with you and then um, I wanna we usually take a break around 10, but I don't wanna cut you off. So, uh, so welcome, good morning. Good morning for the record, Rory Tebow, Washington County State's Attorney. And uh, for those who know me well, a 10 minute limitation on speaking is probably a good thing. Uh, I, primarily today, I just wanted to be able to answer questions and um, the, Michelle did a, a great job of the of walkthrough and the discussion of why some of the changes were made. And I appreciate um, Zachary's comments today as well on behalf of Disability Rights Vermont. And I, I think David Chair should get credit for this from the AG's office of being really the one to note that there is an inherent friction when we start talking about limitations on somebody with a, either a psychiatric uh, illness or a developmental disability. Um, many people who experience uh, those conditions are perfectly capable of consenting and making their own choices in proper circumstances. So ensuring that we're not infringing upon uh, the protected activities and, the, and their um, bodily autonomy is incredibly important. And that was really contributed to the reason why um, I think both the state's attorneys and uh, AG's office supported um, removing some of the language that was originally included about, um, vulnerable, you know, for lack of a better term, vulnerable adults because of what we have in a specific statute. I did put in the chat window um, the definition of what constitutes vulnerable adult. And I think it's important to note that it's not just somebody who is in an acute situation inside of a psychiatric hospital or is receiving services from either Dale or DMH. Rather, subpart D, I think, covers what we're looking at where a particular um, vulnerability, whether it's a traumatic brain injury, 
uh, infirmities of aging or a physical, mental, or developmental disability impacts someone's ability to care for themselves or, or more importantly, and in this context, protect himself or herself from abuse, neglect, or exploitation. So that flexible standard already exists. Um, and I think some of the questions that I've seen by email and, and some conversations with members and also with Michelle, uh, it's important that when we talk about the term substantial, whether in the context of alcohol intoxicants or looking at consent in the context of a vulnerable adult, it still loops back to that critical definition of incapable of consenting. So I think subpart 10 of 3251, the definitions, that addition really is some of the most critical language. I also want to briefly note uh, Representative Burdett's comments about substantial. Uh, one thing I can just offer, uh, substantial is defined in Black's Law Dictionary uh, from our Supreme Court and the absence of a specific statutory definition will uh, construct the meaning of a word uh, from secondary sources with Black's Law Dictionary and the plain meaning often being where we look to. So some of the definitions offered by substantial and Black's Law Dic Dictionary include of relating to or involving substance material, real and not imaginary, having actual not fictitious existence, important, essential and material, of real worth and importance, strong, solid, and firm, large and strongly constructed, considerable in extent, amount, or value, larger in volume or number. So again, um, I had this conversation with some members, but reading substantial impairment in conjunction with incapable of consenting doesn't radically transform the definition. I think it emphasizes concerns of others that this, you know, we're not trying to criminalize two people who've had a few beers engaging in consensual sexual activity, quite the contrary. This ensures that the definition sets a high standard and a sustainable standard uh, of where criminal liability uh, begins. So in that sense, um, I know there's some feedback from Council for UVM and the Title IX program with concerns that just using the term impairment might require Title IX to have a broader breadth of investigatory activities than they would want to have because the Title IX program is in part guided by interpretation of state law. So from that standpoint, uh, the substantial doesn't radically in any way really shift or change the burden, but it does have clarity as to what the scope uh, of intent is. So I think that is good language to include. And the final comment that I'll offer today before any questions is um, along with some members and with Michelle among others, um, I did a sort of informal survey of other states around the country, some that are traditionally conservative, some that are liberal, uh, including California, Colorado, Oregon, uh, others that would be more conservative, such as Kansas, Oklahoma. And what it really reflects is that there's a, a been a broad movement in um, jurisdictions of different uh, political leanings to adopt some of the linguistic changes that we're looking at here, uh, giving greater cognizance and credit to incapacitation by substances being um, a distinct theory of sex assault. So I know that previously the Defender General testified about some due process concerns from our perspective. Um, the, I think tight tailoring of the language, use of substantial, clearly defining incapable of consenting, all mitigate those risks and mirror what other jurisdictions have done in constitutionally sustainable manners. So uh, as without goes without saying that we recommend and believe that these are uh, positive changes to enhance the ability to respond and uh, deal with uh, sex assault cases. Great, thank you, thank you very much. And and also, um, my understanding is that the language "person knows" or "reasonably should have known." We not only have that in our vulnerable adults stalking statutes, but that is used in criminal law. Correct. Correct, and I did find specific examples of that. I think in Kansas, Oklahoma, among other jurisdictions, and either Colorado or Oregon, perhaps. <laughs> there's a there's a lot of them. Um, so certainly it's not a, a foreign concept. And again, um, the base of definitions here were taken from the analogous federal and military law, which uh, Congress passed in reforms back in about 2008 and then revised again in 2012. Okay, thank you. That, that's very helpful. And, and again, to summarize, um, so I did understand you say that yes, this is a high bar in terms of the standard, which um, to the terms that um, this Billy Rice was using and then focused on the moment. I, I know that was an important, uh, important point. Yes, and I, I think that, you know, in when actually prosecuting these cases, uh, a lot of emphasis and first investigative inquiry and then um, discovery or the actual merits of a case 
rest on what state the person in, is at that time, not just a general um, you know, condition. So we don't have a per se standard, meaning if someone has, let's say, a, a diagnosis of bipolar disorder, there's no per se presumption that they cannot make decisions for themselves. Um, in, in the context of sexual relations or, or other decisions. Um, but again, that particular vulnerability can manifest in a stressful situation. Uh, we, and during prior testimony, I discussed the uh, flight and fight response along with freeze. These are all considerations that come into play. And it's also incredibly important to note that when we do have a complaint of sex assault by involving a vulnerable adult, it really comes in one of two ways, either from a caretaker where someone actually has assistance or somebody in their life who is potentially a guardian or assist in their day-to-day -day activities, or alternatively, it is the vulnerable adult, him or herself, who makes the complaint. Um, so, and again, even a vulnerable adult, nothing would stop the state from proceeding under a general theory of sex assault without consent, recognizing again that that person can still consent or not consent. And uh, 13, 7, 13 BSA 1379, gives credit to that of two theories of uh, sexual assault on a vulnerable adult, either without the consent of that person or based upon the particular uh, infirmity at that time. Thank you, it's helpful, really helpful. Thank you. Uh, Tom. Hey Rory, uh, thanks for your testimony and thanks for addressing uh, the question I had. And, but um, another question that I had, and I think Michelle suggested that I ask you, um, if both people are substantially uh, impaired um, and a charge is brought, um, is, um, is that not only a, a, a tool for a prosecution, but a tool for defense? So yes, I think that does come into play. And um, you know, mistake of fact as to consent is and remains a defense in that context. So. But even before getting to a, in a trial setting where we have to think about defenses, um, I think I can speak for every prosecutor where we take a really hard look at what are the facts of the case? Can we prove it at trial? And uh, I think Armina, when she testified as, on behalf of the state's attorney's victim advocate program, you know, indicated that we often are stuck having these incredibly difficult conversations where we credit our belief that someone was a victim and yet have to candidly say that we do not believe that we can sustain the burden of proof, which is beyond a reasonable doubt. Reasonable doubt can be generated any number of ways. And certainly uh, when you have a prospective defendant who is under the influence of alcohol, um, the potential for missed signals or misinterpretation of things increases. And oftentimes these cases, when litigated, focus on, on those things and really emphasize the conduct of both parties, particularly um, you know, the victim. So they, are, they remain very difficult cases um, to prove. And again, just as a reminder, most sex assault cases don't have third party witnesses. It is the two people who are, are present in that circumstance and the presence of alcohol or intoxicants means that sometimes our complaining witnesses or vi alleged victims do not have perfect recollection or you know, may have uh, important things that they don't recall that you know, may or may not have happened. It's not uncommon for us to have you know, outside information of of text messages or other things that people won't even remember sending that sometimes become dispositive to the case that would you know show that there was in fact some intention or um, you know agreement that the person later cannot recall. Um, but this is why uh, this is why we have great people like Major Jonas and other people in SIU's and um, hopefully reasonable prosecutors to really assess this and make good decisions up front about whether to proceed with a case or not. Great, thank you. Thank you, uh, Martin. Yeah, if if you could comment, maybe you kind of have, but uh, I I'd like a more direct uh, comment on the suggestions from uh, the disability rights, particularly with respect to the thirty two fifty two B two. I see their their input on the definition of incapable of consenting, and I, I think that's probably clearer, but I think I'm fine with what's already in there. But uh, if you could comment on the suggestion of adding the language or something equivalent to the language, like I was suggesting uh, being a little more consistent, but if you could just comment on that 3252B2 suggestion. So I think that when adding 
So there was previously, if you recall, um, the separate section that dealt with mental, physical, or developmental impairment that was taken out by virtue of, you know, recognize we have an existing statute under um, 13 uh, VSA 1379, the vulnerable adult statute. This would step that, I guess, back, which I'm not sure. Um, you know, again, the, the main concern we had was trying to avoid a circumstance where there are two different uh, theories of criminal liability in two different places that are, you know, similar. Uh, I would note in one case, uh, well, first of all, the maximum punishments are, are different. And then two, um, if it is already covered someplace else, it may not be the best um, to include there. Again, noting that there are other ways to proceed on that theory. So it would be our recommendation uh, to stay with the existing language rather than incorporate the recommended change to B2. And I'm not sure if today, if further discussion has um, you know, changed position or maybe assist in you know, recognizing that there isn't as critical of a need, I think, to amend that. I, no, I, I appreciate that. I just wanted to make sure I got it on the record. I, I do understand that we had taken something similar out before, but uh, wanted to make clear why we may not want to proceed with uh, this, this suggestion. So thank you for kind of re reiterating that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? No. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we are going to take a break and we are going to continue with this because we have not finished with our witnesses. I realize that our um, agenda says otherwise, but I'm hoping that our, our witnesses can stay uh, after the break. So let's come back at uh, uh, Michelle. Um, I'm booked in another committee at 215. So, um, but and you know, just email me if you've got anything and I'll, I'll circle back when I'm when I'm out of the other committees. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. And we, we probably need you later for an amendment. So we'll have to okay. figure that out. <laughs> okay. Uh, so 1020, please. 